Well, good morning, everyone. How are you? Okay, y'all did so much better than 8.30 and 9.35, so I don't even have to ask you to do that again. We are going to have fun this morning. I can tell. I am so glad to be with you. I'm telling you, normally on a Sunday, I am on the other end of this building. Do you know that's a really long walk from this end to that end? It is, but I am thrilled to be with you this morning. Um, I'm gonna ask a couple of questions, just this is the warm up time of the message. Um, so first of all, how many of you either do right now or have at some point in your life worn corrective lenses? So readers, glasses, contacts, LASIK, perfect, perfect. This is good. This, you might actually get something out of it. Um, okay, so those of you who have or do wear corrective lenses, how many of y'all, you didn't have to start until like age 40, you know, when everything starts going south, right? Um, age 40, after age 40, mm -hmm, right? Okay, so how many of you then, um, Maybe you started wearing glasses early on, maybe elementary, middle school, something like that. Yeah, okay, I'm in your camp, you're my people. So I, so I had to wear glasses early on, but it's really interesting because I didn't know that I needed glasses for a long time. I didn't realize that I couldn't see as well as the other children. Luckily, had really good teachers, really great parents um, because I didn't get glasses till fourth grade, but it was probably around second grade, third grade, I started doing the desk leapfrog thing. You know what I'm saying? So like I'm the back row and I'm looking like this, like I know she's writing something on that chalkboard. I have no idea, but luckily very observant teacher says, Susan, let's just move you up a little bit to the next row. Yeah, that's. Mm, not good. Okay, and so until, like, by fourth grade, I am, I couldn't be closer to the chalkboard. I am front, I am center, and I'm still doing like this. She's like, I think it's time to talk to your parents. So she did, my parents, and there's like, it's time, it's time to go to the doctor. So I went to the eye doctor, had the experience that most of you had, where you go and you sit in the chair and you rest your little chin on that little thing, and then this big, like, mask deal comes, like, right here, and then they give you a pop quiz. Like, no one told me that. They put, and, and you know what it is, better one, better two. One, two. Do we have eye doctors here? I just wanna, do they teach you to say it like that? Because everybody does, right? It's this very calming voice. I don't know if they think that it's very stressful and they're trying to be very calm and give you a sense of peace, but you know, and you go through this and they click, click and flip, flip and everything. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh my gosh, those are not black squiggles at the bottom of that chart. Those are letters, who knew? Which is great, but then they pull a fast one on you and you say, they say, okay, go home now. Now that you know you can't see, you go home because now we have to make these glasses that are gonna look like Coke bottles. Um, for you. And so, um, so in fourth grade, I, I got my, my glasses and it was amazing. I remember the day that I uh, came, I went and I finally got the glasses. I put them on and it's like, oh, this is amazing. Like these green blobs, they're trees. Trees have leaves on them. The, I have bionic vision. This is amazing. Now, thank goodness I don't have any embarrassing photo of me in eighth grade. <laughs> I'm telling you what, is she a looker or what? Look at those massive glasses that like take over half of my face, braces, and who thought ruffles on shirts went, hey, wait a minute, it came back. Okay, yeah, that was me. This is why I didn't date for a really long time. <laughs> but the cool thing about glasses is that I could now finally read the signs as we were driving down the road before they came right upon me. I could sit in the back of the classroom if I wanted to. Of course, I was a teacher's pet, so I still sat up front. But anyway, um, and at recess, I could see the ball being thrown at me. 
Didn't mean I could catch it any better, but I could duck a whole lot faster. Okay, glass is amazing. Vision, vision. It is an incredible gift. And then when I was 30, it got better because I had LASIK surgery. Miracle. I'm telling you what, I could see perfect. I could see better than perfect because one of my eyes was 2015 and I'm a high achiever. So that was really good. It's like not only do I have bionic vision, I got perfect vision, better than perfect. This is great, it's perfect. Now the Bible talks about vision actually in a couple of different ways. Um, in some respects, it talks about visions. These are revelations um, that are given, revelations of God's character, um, um, visions of future. It's a visions of, of call to actions. And there are so many examples in the Bible of that kind of vision. Um, Abram, before he was Abraham, uh, receives a vision. God says, I'm gonna give you a son. You're gonna be the father of many nations. Ezekiel, the prophet, has a, a vision, it's a revelation where he sees with his own eyes the glory of the Lord. Daniel gets vision of the future. Ananias receives a vision from God who says, I need you to go find this guy, Saul, who's had a transformative experience on the road to Damascus. Paul receives a vision, and it's a man in Macedonia who says, please come and share the gospel message with us. So that's one kind of vision. But the Bible also addresses vision in a different way, in a corrective way, in a way where sight is restored. And we see that Jesus has miracles where he has given sight to the blind Bartimaeus, the, man, uh, the blind man at Bethsaida, Jesus gives the power of restoring sight to his disciples. Vision, it's an incredible gift, a once in a lifetime experience, or is it? See, we are this summer um, having an opportunity to go through this series called Songs of a Lifetime. I'm really excited about it. Um, Bishop Hayes and I have had these conversations before about how important music is to us. And um, I promise you, if they put the Bible to music, I might actually remember scripture. But um, it's just, there's something about singing those truths, singing those songs. It just, it just gets in your heart and it gets in your mind. And it's so powerful. So we thought, wouldn't it be cool if we invited pastors to come and pick out their favorite hymn and come talk about it? Like, what's the powerful story behind it? How has that impacted your life? So, so we're in this series called Songs of a Lifetime. And last week, Bishop Hayes started us off in talking about victory in Jesus. And so today, I want us to talk about a song called Be Thou My Vision. Now let me give you a little background of how this hymn came to be. It really was inspired by the story of St. Patrick. We know St. Patrick, we used to talk about him in March. Well, St. Patrick was born in Scotland. As a young man, he was captured by pirates, yeah, real pirates, and taken to Ireland where he was a slave. Eventually, he escaped, was able to go back to Scotland. The people of his village were excited. They were thrilled. Thank God for his life. And they said, Patrick, Patrick, you can't ever leave again. Well, at age 30, Patrick receives a vision, much like Paul's vision of the Macedonian man. Patrick receives a vision of a man from Ireland who says, I want you to come and share the message of Christ. And so Patrick wrestles with it, but he knows his purpose. He knows what he's called to do. And with a Bible in one hand and a bold voice, he goes to Ireland and he preaches the word. Through his life, lifetime, Patrick, um, he uh, planted over 200 churches, baptized over 100,000 people. This is amazing. His story inspired a poem that was written in the 8th century. That poem was then translated into English in 1905 by Mary Byrne. A few years later, it was put, crafted into verse by Eleanor Hull, and then was paired with an Irish folk tune. And that has become our hymn number 451, Be Thou My Vision. So I am actually gonna ask you 
to get out hymnals. Do you know we have hymnals in this room? <laughs> Hopefully you don't have to, you know, get dust off of it, I'm, I'm hopeful. But, I mean, I love our screens, don't get me wrong. But we have these too. So get out your hymnal. I want you to turn to 451. And you're just going to kind of keep it open. Um, if you have ever been part of my Bible study, Radiant Bible study, you know that one, I am an information junkie. I love to gather information. I also love it when we study together. So if you are in Radiant, and sh shameless plug, if you're not, join us this fall, but I love it when I get everyone like, put your Bible, get your Bible out, get your resources out. I mean, we're going to go through this together and you're going to write it. Don't write in these hymnals, okay? But you, you know, I love it when we do that. So uh, if you are a great multitasker, you can have your hymnal on one knee and your Bible in another, but it's okay. I'm going to walk us through the scripture, but if you will keep out your hymnal, I, I really, I want, I want us to look at these words. They're important words. Our hymnal, actually, this is a side note, bonus material. There are three verses that we have in our hymnal, but when it was first written, there were actually five verses. So if you want to go over the other two verses with me later, call me and we'll set up an appointment. We'll talk about it. Um, visions, they're powerful. They're important. But I don't believe they're once in a lifetime experiences. I don't believe when we sing this song or when we pray, because really singing it in worship is a prayer. I don't believe that we are praying and asking God for one revelation of his character, for one vision of the future, for one call to action. I don't think that at all. Actually, I think when we sing this, when we pray to God, we're not just supposed to ask him to correct our vision but we need to pray and ask him to be our constant vision. I think that's what this hymn is all about. I think that that is what scripture tells us too. So how do we do this? How do we ask God, not just to correct our vision, but to be our constant vision? Well, I think we can look at the passage that Bishop Hayes read for us of Peter. Um, when I was studying this hymn, I mean, God just like kept moving me uh, to this passage, this story of, of Peter. And so we're going to look at it. Again, uh, we'll have the words on the screen, but if you want to get your Bible out, that would be great too. Let me give you a context. So we're in Acts chapter 10, but what has already happened? Well, Pentecost has already happened. And we know at Pentecost, Holy Spirit came down, 3,000 people were converted because Peter preached boldly, and then God continued to add to their numbers daily. Now, Peter then continued to travel, and he has found himself at Joppa. Now, 30 miles north of Joppa is Caesarea. In Caesarea is Cornelius. Cornelius is a centurion. He is a God-fearing, devout Gentile. Cornelius receives a vision. The angel of the Lord comes to him and says, Cornelius, I want you to get some men. You send them down to find Peter, and you bring Peter back because you need to hear what Peter has to say. And so that is what brings us to the passage that we're going to look at today. So let's just review the first few verses of this passage, starting in verse 9. About noon the following day, as they, that's the three men that Cornelius has sent down, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry, wanted something to eat, and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened up and something like a large sheep being let down on the earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. And then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Okay, so because um, I caught the first two services off guard, I'm giving you a heads up. I'm about to ask a question and I'm hoping you can answer it. Okay, ready for it? All right, so what was Peter doing. He was praying. All right, excellent. So what was Peter doing? See, I, I'm very interactive, so just stay with me. Stay with me. So what is Peter doing? Peter is in prayer. Why is that important? I'll tell you why. It's because 
For us to ask God to be our constant vision, we need to be in prayer. Why? Because we need to renew our spirit. We always need to be in a place where we can renew our spirit, and one of the best ways to do that is to be in prayer. So where is Peter? Peter has gone up to the roof. Um, Those houses back then, they had a flat top, so to be able to go up on the roof meant you were able to retreat. You were able to get outside of the hustle and bustle of the street, of other noise. This is where you were able to find your solitude. So Peter positioned himself to be in communion with God. Have you ever found yourself with that need? Like where you just needed to get away. You needed to retreat. You needed to hear God talk to you. All of us find ourselves in that place, even the best of us, even those of you who are way better at that spiritual discipline than I am, and you know who you are, Steve Powell, um, you have that special, he's on the front row, this is, I had to pick on him, you have that special chair in your house, and you have it just so you look outside that window and see God's nature, and you, you have your Bible and your Bible study material, and you, every single day, you, without fail, you get up and you sit in that chair, and you commune with God for 45 minutes or an hour, and angels sing, and is, because I know, I know, some of you, most of you probably are better than I am, and so you do this every day. You have the great ability to sit and pray for God, with God, and even you need that time of retreat. We all need to step away, find solitude, put ourselves in a different position. I found that this past week in probably a rather unusual location. Instead of going on the rooftop, I went about 40 feet under the surface of the water. I think we have a picture. Yep, there's me. So scary. All right, you can take that off the screen. Um, Amazing. It was amazing to be able to go down where it's truly so peaceful. The only thing that I could hear was my own breathing. Now, a little scary, because you sound like Darth Vader's, you're right? But if you can get over that, everything else is peaceful. Everything else is so quiet. And you could tell that's not Galveston, right? That's Florida, because you could see in the water. What I was able to do is view God's creation that I had never been able to see with my own eyes before, and it was beautiful. And I felt like God was um, speaking to me. I felt like God was reminding me that he is the creator God, that he is the God of the universe that there is nothing on this earth that he hasn't touched and he hasn't formed. It was like he told me, I know what worries you brought with you on this trip. I know what you're holding on to. But don't you see that I care as much, I care for these little fish, I I care for the tiniest little coral, If I care for them, how much more do I care for you? There is nowhere, Susan, that you can go when you're not in my presence. It was a beautiful moment that God used to renew my spirit, to meet me where I was. Now, Peter retreated, went to the rooftop, and Peter's a pretty good example, but let's face it, Peter is not perfect. We know this, right? So don't get way too impressed. Uh, He is typical of us. He's up there on the roof. He is praying, but what's happening? Lord, I love you. I'm so hungry. I wonder where that sandwich is going to be. No, 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 no. Focus, focus, focus. Lord, I want to, I could really use a big glass of water. No, 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 no. Peter 
gets hungry. Peter zones out. This is not the first time Peter zones out either. Let's remember Garden of Gethsemane. When Jesus, his Lord, his Savior, asks him to pray, Peter falls asleep. So Peter is a great example, but he also makes us feel pretty good because he's not perfect, but God doesn't say we have to be perfect. He says you don't have to be perfect in your prayer life. You just have to be positioned where you're going to hear me. You need to be positioned where you can be in communion with me and then let me take the rest and renew your spirit. Now look at that first verse of that hymn. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. He said, be my vision, Lord. Don't let anything else in this world satisfy me except for you. Thou my vision best thought by day or by night, waking or sleeping, thy presence, my light. It is a daily call to prayer, a daily call to put God at the center of our lives. So what happens then? Let's keep reading in Acts. Um, After Peter hears Um, the Lord say, get up, go kill and eat, then Peter decides that he's going to respond. And he responds by saying, surely not, Lord, because it's always good to say, Lord, I think you're wrong. Um, Surely not, Lord, I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. And the voice spoke to him a second time. Look, don't call anything impure that God has made clean. This happens, how many times? three times. Immediately, the sheet was taken back up to heaven while Peter was wondering about the meaning of this vision. The men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. Okay, so we need to renew our spirit. We also need to renew our mind. So what is Peter doing? He has had this experience. He hears God, but he is confused. He is wrestling. He knows. He grew up um, in a Jewish household. He knew the Jewish laws. He knew what was clean and not clean. And he is wrestling because what he's hearing right now does not jive with how he grew up. And he has got to be remembering back when he walked with Jesus, and we read this in Mark 7, how Jesus said, it is not what goes in that defiles someone. It's what comes out. And right after Jesus did that, he ministered to a Gentile woman. So Peter has got to have all of these things whirling around, and he is trying to figure out. He is wrestling, and the scripture says he wondered. I think that's being polite. I think Peter was doubting. I do. I think he was doubting. And you know what? We as good Christian people love to shame people for doubting. We do. We think, you know what? I I shouldn't doubt. If I have faith of a mustard seed, I shouldn't doubt. If I'm a really good Christian, if if I have faith, I won't doubt. Let me take that away from you. You know what? I like doubt. I think doubt is okay. Do you know why? Because if you are doubting, that means you're wrestling with something. That means you're asking questions. And if you're going to ask questions, then that means you're going to be open to hearing the answer. I don't think God is at all concerned with you sharing your doubts with him and asking him and talking to him. He would rather you doubt out loud to him and have him speak to you than you just hold on. It's like, well, I guess I'm just supposed to remember and just believe that. No, he wants you to. So that's okay. Peter's okay. He's doubting. He's opening his mind mind to hearing what God has to say. That's how we renew our mind. And God, because he's a better parent than I am, is patient, and he repeats himself. And this also seems to be a pattern with Peter, right? We know, you will deny me, not me, Lord, three times. Do you love me, Peter? Lord, you know I love you three times. So once again, God says, you know what? I love you so much, Peter. I don't mind repeating myself because I want you to get this. I want you to renew your mind. I want you to be open. Romans 12, 2 tells us that to be transformed, we need to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. That's right. 
And when we think back to this idea of vision, that we need God to be our constant vision, sometimes we get so far-sighted. Like our minds, we are thinking so far about, like this is my goal, this is my dream, this is where I'm gonna go, that we miss what God is doing right here in front of us, while he has put someone right in our path that he wants us to minister to, but we are so far-sighted, we miss those opportunities. And sometimes the opposite happens. Sometimes we become so nearsighted where all we can think about is our problem right here and exactly what we're doing and what is today. And God is out there going, woo, y'all, yield ahead, yield ahead. I'm about to turn and make a turn in your path, but you don't see it because you're so focused down here. If we're gonna have God as the constant vision, we need to renew our spirit, but we need to renew our mind. Look at the second verse. Be thou my what? Wisdom. Be thou my wisdom, and thou my true word. I ever with thee, and thou with me, Lord. Thou, and thou only, first in my heart. Great God of heaven, my treasure, thou art. Wisdom. Be my wisdom. Colossians 3.16 says, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. Be your wisdom. I ever with thee, abide in me, Lord. Let me abide with you. May I always be with you daily. Great God of heaven, my treasure, my heart. In Matthew 6.12, where your treasure is there, your heart will be also, right? Constant vision, renewing of your mind. Wayne Dyer, an author, has this great quote that says, if you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Get that? If you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change change. When God is our focal point, when God is our fixed point that we are going to look at, it doesn't matter where God moves us. It doesn't matter what paths we take because we are focused constantly on God, that he is where our priorities are, that we use the lens of God to see our world, and then the world changes We see it differently. So we renew our spirit. We're going to renew our mind. But then we're going to renew our purpose. Let's go back to Peter. So they, the three men, call out, asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the the spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up, go downstairs, and do not hesitate to go with them for I've sent them. Peter went down, said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? When did Peter act? Peter acted while he was still thinking. Peter didn't wait until he had figured it out. Peter didn't wait until everything made sense. He knew enough that if God was speaking, even if he didn't get it, he trusted enough to go ahead and step out, to act right then. Peter knew his purpose. His purpose was to proclaim the good news. So he acted. Now, if I'm Peter, I might be tempted to say, Lord, I believe over 3,000 people have come to faith because I've been doing my job. I, where's everyone else? I mean, little slackers, come on. Like, uh, let me just step back and let someone else do that. As a church with almost or over 13,000 members, we could say, Lord, we've done our part. Let's let the other churches catch up. But that's not what God says because God's vision is bigger. 
God's vision never stops. We can be okay in our routines. We can have our little Christian routine life and like we know, we know how to do this thing. We know to have our morning devotion time. We know to go to church once a week. We know in the fall we're gonna sign up for a Bible study because someone's gonna ask us to and we're gonna feel bad if we don't so we go ahead and do it. And then in missions, we're gonna sign well, well, one or two times should fulfill my duties for missions and we do that and we get so comfortable in that life and we're going you know what we are going and doing fine but that's when the vision blurs I told you at age 30 I had LASIK surgery I had perfect vision y'all perfect so good well last year um, I started squinting again I was sitting on the couch and I'm watching TV, put on the little guide, I'm like, why can't I read the name of the TV shows? What's wrong with me? And so my husband, who's very helpful and a fixer, says, you should go to the doctor. And I'm saying, I don't have to go to the doctor because I already had my vision corrected. I have perfect vision. And uh, he's like, okay, whatever. Well, it turns out I did just to, you know, cause I was gonna prove him right. I went to the eye doctor, and it turns out my eyesight was deteriorating. And it turns out I needed glasses again. Oh my goodness! Do you know how many pews we have here? <laughs> Y'all in the back row! You do look good! Bishop Hayes is right! Hey! Hi! Yeah, so it turns out that when we ask God to be our vision, we cannot just ask him to correct our vision. We cannot become complacent with our vision. We need to be constantly renewed so he becomes our constant because God never stops working. God never stops wanting to share the gospel message with the world. This is why I'm so excited. I mean, we love music. We love these hymns. We should never stop teaching these hymns. But I am so excited that Mark Swayze, Josh Price, all those amazing musicians are making more music because they understand that we need to continue to tell this story because the generations behind us, they're going to do so much more for the kingdom than we ever have. God is not done. Look at this final hymn. This final verse of our hymn, great God of heaven, my victory won. Do you hear pattern? Victory, right? Victory in Jesus, my victory won. May I reach heaven's joys, O oh, bright heaven's sun, heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still, still be my vision, O oh, ruler of all. No matter what, no matter what befalls, what, no matter good, bad, indifferent that happens in my life, no matter what, I don't wanna be complacent. I want to have God as my constant vision. I want daily renewal. I wanna sing these songs into the day I don't have a breath anymore. We need to be singing these truths until the whole world hears. Amen?